From Pacifica, this is Democracy Now! I signed a very good executive order yesterday, but that's only limited. No matter how you cut it, it leads to separation ultimately. As the U.S. military prepares to house up to 20,000 immigrant children on military bases, the Justice Department wants to lift the 20-day limit on family detention. Meanwhile, thousands of immigrant parents still don't know where their children are after they were taken from them at the border. We'll go to the border, to Brownsville, Texas, to speak with reporter Debbie Nathan. She just interviewed a Guatemalan woman whose five-year-old son was taken from her last month by immigration authorities in Texas after she sought asylum. This week, she reunited with him after 38 days in detention. They tricked me. They told me we should go to the bus that we were leaving. I was happy I was going to be with my son. When I sat down on the bus, my boy and I were both crying. Then they said, ma'am, get off. Then Code Red. That's the name of an explosive new Human Rights Watch report that exposes dangerously substandard medical care in ICE detention centers. Moises Tino Lopez had first one and then a second seizure in immigration detention. Our medical experts said, that the first seizure and certainly the second seizure should have prompted a high level of care and concern. That did not happen. And he ultimately had a third seizure that was fatal. We'll speak with Clara Long of Human Rights Watch. Then we look at the case of an Eritrean man deported from the United States who took his own life at the Cairo International Airport on, after being deported. He had been detained for more than a year after fleeing his home country seeking asylum here. He feared death if he were to return. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. The U.S. military is preparing to house up to 20,000 immigrant children on military bases in Texas and Arkansas. A Pentagon spokesperson said the bases would house, quote, unaccompanied alien children, unquote. But other reports suggest the bases might be used to indefinitely hold entire families, following President Trump's executive order ending the separation of children from their parents at the border. On Thursday, the Justice Department asked a federal court permission to alter a settlement that limits family detention to 20 days. This comes as the government is facing growing criticism for having no system in place to reunite thousands of children with their parents after being separated at the border. Groups like the Texas Civil Rights Project are scrambling to locate children who've been sent to detention centers around the country. The group is representing more than 300 parents, but has been unable to track down, has only been able to track down about two children. The former head of the Office of Refugee Resettlement under President Obama has sharply criticized the Trump administration. Bob Carey said, quote, this is child abuse being perpetrated by a government. On Capitol Hill, Republicans have postponed a vote on a broad immigration bill, as the party's leadership acknowledged it lacked enough votes. House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi slammed the legislation, which would result in the indefinite detention of asylum seekers and $25 billion to build the militarized wall along the Mexican border. The Speaker's bill carries out the president's family deportation agenda. It paves the way for the low long-term incarceration of families in prison-like conditions and the denial of basic health and safety protections for children. The Republican plan is a family incarceration plan. It replaces one form of child abuse with another, and it brazenly violates children's human rights. Why do Republicans think traumatized, terrified little children at the border do not deserve the same basic respect that their own children do? Early this morning, President Trump tweeted, Republicans should stop wasting their time on immigration until after we elect more senators and congressmen women in November. On Thursday, First Lady Melania Trump made an unannounced trip to a detention center for immigrant children in Texas. As she left Washington, she was wearing a jacket that read, I really don't care, do you? 
While much of the nation's attention has been on the U.S.-Mexican border, immigration authorities carried out its largest workplace raid in recent history this week. Federal agents arrested 146 employees at Freshmark, a major meat supplier in Ohio. It was the second-largest ICE raid in Ohio in recent weeks. Meanwhile, dozens of protesters, including many parents with babies, attempted to occupy the ICE field office in New York on Thursday. And we're outside the federal building near Foley Square, which is the site of the regional ICE office here in New York. There's another group of us, of parents and kids, who went in. They're singing songs inside. They're presenting demands. The children that are being kept in cages have no clue what is going on. The least you could do is tell the parents that they will see their kids. They are probably wasting away in worry. They love their kids, and they want to know it will be okay. We were a safe haven to those in need, but we are no more. I hope that you will be here. Take peaceful. Sorry. Take peaceful action. I love the least of these. Protesters at the ICE office in New York. A Guatemalan woman, who has been living in the United States for 13 years, has announced she's sought sanctuary with two of her children in a New York church in an attempt to avoid deportation. 32-year-old Deborah Berenice Vasquez spoke to the press on Thursday. When I received notice to leave this country, I was heartbroken. I could not think about what it would do to my family, to my kids. It will rip us apart. I understand now what the mothers are feeling that are being separated from their children. And it's important that we remember that this is not only happening on the border, but it is also happening in New York and in cities and states across the country. Deborah Berenice Vasquez speaking inside the St. Paul and St. Andrew United Methodist Church. New York gubernatorial candidate and actress Cynthia Nixon voiced her support for Deborah. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts for offering sanctuary to Deborah and her children. And thank you for giving us all a place to gather today, to stand up with one voice as New Yorkers and say no, and say no, not in our name, not in our name. During an interview at the church, gubernatorial candidate Cynthia Nixon described ICE as a terrorist organization. ICE has strayed so far from its mission. Uh, it's supposed to be here to keep Americans safe, but what it's turned into is, is frankly, a terrorist uh, organization of its own that is terrorizing people who are coming to this country. The governor has said of New York that 700 children have been transported here, separated from their parents at the border. In Pennsylvania, hundreds of protesters in East Pittsburgh shut down a major highway overnight for five hours to protest the police killing of Antoine Rose, a 17-year-old African-American high school senior. Video of the shooting shows Rose was shot in the back while trying to flee police after a traffic stop. Police have admitted he was unarmed. Rose was set to graduate from high school. This year, the killing has sparked two days of protest in Pittsburgh. And being treated as though we don't realize racism exists, we don't realize that we are being murdered in numbers, mass numbers, and more and more police are coming forward and being bold and brave to kill more and more black people, and we won't stand for it. In an earlier demonstration, a protester read a poem Antoine had written about police brutality in 2016. I hear that there's only two ways out. I see mothers bury their sons. I want my mom to never feel that pain. I'm confused and afraid. I pretend all is fine. I feel like I'm suffocating. I touch nothing, so I believe all is fine. The officer who shot Antoine had just been sworn in a few hours before. In related news, a new study in the Lancet Medical Journal has found that police killings of unarmed black Americans directly harms the mental health of the wider black population. 
One of the report's authors said, quote, "...it's really about all the kinds of insidious ways that structural racism can make people sick." Accused NSA whistleblower Reality Winner has signed a plea deal and is scheduled to formally change her plea to guilty next week. Winner has been jailed for the past year, awaiting trial over charges she leaked a top-secret document to The Intercept about Russian interference in the 2016 election. Winner had faced up to 10 years in prison for violating the Espionage Act. Details of the plea agreement have not been made public. The White House has proposed merging the U.S. Labor and Education Departments into a single agency as part of a sweeping reform of the federal government. Randy Weingarten, president of the American Federation of Teachers, condemned the proposal. She said, quote, We're extremely skeptical of the motivations here, given how hostile Betsy DeVos and President Trump have been to public education, workers and unions. It seems like this move is just cover for continuing their agenda to go after public schools, gut civil rights and equity protections, provide support for predatory student loan companies and prey on workers. Those are the words of AFT President Randy Weingarten. The Trump administration's proposal also calls for restructuring the U.S. Postal Service and for the potential privatization of both the Federal Aviation Administration's air traffic control services and the St. Lawrence Seaway. In news from the United Nations, U.S. Ambassador Nikki Haley has slammed a new U.N. report by U.N. Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights, Philip Alston, who recently toured the United States. Haley said, quote, "...it's patently ridiculous for the United Nations to examine poverty in America." Haley's comment comes just days after the U.S. pulled out of the U.N. Human Rights Council. Last week, Philip Alston appeared on Democracy Now! to discuss his findings. Vast numbers of people are left uh, living without enough to get by on, uh, <laughs> the 40 million living in poverty, uh, the figure of 5.3 million, which has been uh, estimated of people who live in, quote, third world conditions in this country. More than 100 people were arrested at the U.S. Capitol Thursday in an action organized by the Poor People's Campaign to protest the Trump administration's mistreatment of immigrants. Among those arrested included the Reverend William Barber and David Goodman, the brother of slain civil rights worker Andrew Goodman. Thursday's action took place on the anniversary of the 1964 disappearance of James Cheney, Michael Schwerner and Andrew Goodman, whose bodies were found buried in a dam in Philadelphia, Mississippi, August 4, 1964. The Poor People's Campaign is holding a major march on the U.S. Capitol on Saturday. Reporters Without Borders has called on the Israeli parliament to reject a new bill that would criminalize the taking of photographs and videos of Israeli soldiers. Violations could result in jail sentences of five years if the photograph or video harmed the morale of Israel's soldiers, or 10 years in jail if it harmed the security of the state. The bill was introduced in April after video emerged showing an Israeli soldier cheering after shooting an unarmed Palestinian in Gaza. And in other news from Israel, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's wife, Sarah Netanyahu, has been indicted for fraud and misuse of state funds. She's accused of ordering $100,000 worth of catered meals at their official residence. If convicted, she could be sentenced to up to eight years in prison. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We begin today's show with an update on the more than 2,300 children separated from their families at the U.S.-Mexico border after their parents were charged with illegal entry under the Trump administration's ongoing zero-tolerance policy. The U.S. military is preparing to house up to 20,000 immigrant children on military bases in Texas and Arkansas. A Pentagon spokesperson said the bases would house, quote, unaccompanied alien children. But other reports suggest the bases might be used to indefinitely hold entire families, following President Trump's executive order ending the separation of children from their parents at the border. 
This comes as the Justice Department has asked a federal court permission to alter a settlement that limits family detention to 20 days. The former head of the Office of Refugee Resettlement under President Obama, Bob Kerry, has sharply criticized the Trump administration. Bob Kerry said, quote, this is child abuse being perpetrated by a government. On Thursday, a senior Trump administration official told the Associated Press that 500 children have been reunited with their family within days of being separated. He was an unnamed official. Meanwhile, other parents say they still don't know where their children are. Trump spoke to reporters about family reunification on Thursday. I signed a very good executive order yesterday, but that's only limited, no matter how you cut it. It leads to separation, ultimately. I'm directing HHS, DHS and DOJ to work together to keep illegal immigrant families together during the immigration process and to reunite these previously separated groups. On Thursday, First Lady Melania Trump made an unannounced trip to a detention center for immigrant children in Texas. As she left Washington and came back, she was wearing a jacket that read, scrawled across the back of the jacket, I really don't care, do you? She spoke to reporters after her visit. I begin to recognize each of you and thanking you for all what you do, uh, for your heroic work uh, that you do every day and uh, what you do for those children. We all know they're having, they're here without their families. And I also like to ask you how I can help to these children to reunite with their families uh, you know, as quickly as possible. When she asked how the children were doing, one of the workers at the facility said that they are traumatized. Meanwhile, mayors of about 20 U.S. cities gathered at a holding facility for immigrant children in the border city of El Paso and accused Trump of failing to address the crisis. Back in Washington, a hard-right immigration bill failed to pass the House, and Republican leaders delayed a planned vote on a compromise bill that would offer Dreamers a pathway to citizenship and includes $25 billion for Trump's border wall. Around the country, protests continued against Trump's zero-tolerance policy. In New York, dozens of parents and babies took over the offices of the field office of Director for ICE Enforcement and Removal Operations. Children sang together and drew on paper hearts to leave behind in support of the more than uh, 2,300 children taken from their parents. This is one of the kids speaking through tears. The children that are being kept in cages have no clue what is going on. The least you can do is tell the parents that they will see their kids. They are probably wasting away in worry. They love their kids, and they want to know it will be okay. We were a safe haven to those in need, but we are no more. I hope that you will be here, take peaceful, sorry, take peaceful action, and love the least of these. Also here in New York, an immigrant mother from Guatemala who fears deportation went into physical sanctuary in a church in New York City on Thursday. Deborah Berenice Vasquez said she was told to leave the country in May during a routine check-in with federal officials at ICE and fears separation from her 10-year-old son, Kinner, a U.S. citizen. I understand now what the mothers are feeling that are being separated from their children. And it's important that we remember that this is not only happening on the border, but it is also happening in New York and in cities and states across the country. Concerns grow about poor coordination between Customs and Border Patrol, which takes the children, and the Office of Refugee Resettlement, which puts them into shelters and foster care. The Intercept has a new report on one of the first reunifications. Reporter Debbie Nathan spoke to a Guatemalan woman whose five-year-old son was taken from her last month by immigration authorities in Texas after she sought asylum. She's been reunited with him after 38 days in detention. 
This is a clip from The Intercept's video when we hear the mother, Delia, who uses a pseudonym, describe what happened. We'll hear that clip after this break. Hush, Hush, My Baby by Carbon Canella. This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman. As concerns grow about poor coordination between Customs and Border Patrol, which takes the children, the Office of Refugee Resettlement, which puts them into shelters and foster care, The Intercept has a new report on one of the first reunifications. Reporter Debbie Nathan spoke to a Guatemalan woman whose five-year-old son was taken from her last month by immigration authorities in Texas after she sought asylum. She's been reunited with him after 38 days in detention. This is a clip from The Intercept's video, when we hear the mother, Delia, who uses a pseudonym, describing what happened. They tricked me. They told me we should go to the bus that we were leaving. I was happy I was going to be with my son. When I sat down on the bus, my boy and I were both crying. Then they said, ma'am, get off. I thought I was going to get out on Monday or Tuesday. But then they said, clean your bed, because you're going today, right now. I was so excited. I was jumping up and down with happiness. And all my compañeras, when I left, clapped with happiness that I was going to see my son, because they saw how, night and day, I'd been crying, wanting to be with my son. Oh, I'm so happy because I have my son. For more, we're joined by Debbie Nathan, independent journalist based in Brownsville, Texas, on the Mexico border. She reports for The Intercept, her latest piece. An abused woman came to the U.S. seeking asylum. The government took her five-year-old son. This is how she got him back. Debbie, welcome back to Democracy Now! Can you describe just that? How did, well, the woman who's going by the name Delia get her little boy back? Well, it just took an incredible amount of resources, and it was really happenstance. What happened was I had um, located this woman and started investigating her case back in early May, and then as I continued the reporting, I contacted organizations and, and lawyers to get more information about how the process works or doesn't work. And in the course of that reporting, a lawyer said that she would go visit Delia in detention. And she went and did that and decided to take her case. So now she had a pro bono lawyer, which is something that most people in this situation don't have at this point. And um, this lawyer is a very good immigration lawyer and um, guided or prepared Delia to do a credible fear hearing, which she had, and it was very successful, and she passed her credible fear test. So then the lawyer um, went to all kinds of, you know, worked really hard to um, arrange with the um, agency that had managed the case of the little boy, who probably had him in foster care. I'm not quite sure where he was. But so she did paperwork, and as soon as um, Daly got out of detention, she and her husband, the lawyer and her husband, drove her down to get her little boy. So it was a lot of work that took place outside of the government system, of whatever the government 
says it's going to be doing or has done. This this all took place outside, and it was a really wonderful thing, but it was very exceptional. Talk about that. How exceptional is it? The government has just floated through an unnamed official that 500 parents have been reunited with their children. You would think, if that were the case, that they would not put this through an unnamed official. Usually, you do that when you don't want to trace back a lie um, to someone. What is your sense uh, in Brownsville of what's happening? Um, well. You know, I haven't heard about people being reunited en masse. In fact, um, the lawyers and the, sort of this loose coalition of people in Texas that have been trying to find these people and go in and interview them in detention centers and try to give them representation, the case that I reported on is the first one that they know of where somebody was actually reunited. So I'm not really sure what that means. It's certainly not something that we hear about in Brownsville, which is the thick of the situation. Most people who've had been separated have been in this in this area. I want to talk about the director of the Office of Refugee Resettlement, Scott Lloyd. ORR, the Office of Refugee Resettlement, is the agency tasked with caring for the thousands of children who've been forcefully taken, forcibly taken from their parents. According to a political article headlined, Meet the Anti-Abortion Trump Appointee Taking Care of Separated Kids, they write, Prior to assuming leadership at ORR, Lloyd co-founded the Witness Works Foundation for a Culture of Life, an organization dedicated to Catholic teachings and guided by the principles of our faith, and worked for years in its legal arm. At the Knights of Columbus, he described himself on his resume as the architect of late-term abortion restrictions passed by six states, while writing articles about banning dismemberment abortion, as he put it, and big abortion, evolving profit structure, he said. Lloyd also served in the George W. Bush administration as an attorney at HHS, Health and Human Services, co-writing the 2008 Conscience Rule, allowing medical providers to refuse contraceptives, abortions and other care on moral grounds. That's the piece in Politico describing the man who is in charge of what will happen to these thousands of children taken from their parents. It doesn't sound like he has much experience with refugees, Debbie Nathan. Yeah, that's right. And um, in shelters that house young uh, teenage minors, uh, girls, females, um, there have been several cases where they've come up and um, pregnant and they've wanted abortions and they've gone through judicial bypass in Texas so that they've been um, given permission in Texas to get an abortion, but um, he will not allow them to get abortions. So he's abrogated their legal right in the United States to um, their legal abortion rights. So, I mean, that seems to be— He personally primary. went down to Texas to try to prevent an immigrant woman from getting an abortion. Is that right? Well, yes, but not only that, um, there, are, there are records where it's clear that he's intervened even without being in Texas. I also want to turn now to New York Congress member Kathleen Rice. Now, apparently, New York has something like 700 of these separated children. They have been flown up to New York. Uh, she appeared on Wolf Blitzer's show on CNN. She was asked by Blitzer if she believed the children separated um, will eventually be reunited with their families. I don't see how that it could possibly happen. And to be frank, the administration has basically admitted that, that there is no way that they can reunify these children with their parents. They didn't take any information at the time that they took them from them. A lot of these kids barely even know their own names, don't speak English. So this reunification process is going to be next to impossible, it seems to me, which, you know, I hope people really understand that. There are 2,300 children who may never never see their parents again, ever. And that's on us, this country, the United States of America. That's New York Congress member Kathleen Rice. Uh, Debbie Nathan, can you respond? Yeah, well, I mean, I think essentially what's happened is that there's going to be an outsourcing. It's already happened. For example, RAICES, which is a, a group that's been involved in, um, you know, advocating for unaccompanied minors 
now just suddenly within a few days collected almost $20 million, you know, just from the public, from people out there in the community all over the country and probably the world. And so they and other groups and other and lawyers, I think, have come together, you know, outside of the government, um, and they will be going in and trying to locate parents in detention, and they will be trying to do this work, exactly what Virginia Raymond, the lawyer who took Delia's case, did. There are just hundreds of people that are getting ready to do this or are already doing it, and I think that's how much of this will happen. So it'll be sort of this privatized, outsourced reunification effort going on already, very heroic, um, I don't think that 2,300 children are never going to see their parents again. I think it will take a long time. It's not systematic, but um, as I said, I don't know. I, I don't think the government is going to be the entity responsible for these reunifications, generally speaking. Uh, we're also joined by Clara Long, senior researcher at Human Rights Watch. If you can weigh in here around the situation of these separated children. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> the agency that's doing these separations, Customs and Border Protection and Border Patrol, has a history of haphazard recording of the identity of especially tender age children. So one of the huge challenges that, that I see coming up is that children have been separated, placed in these OR facilities, who are not young enough to know their parents' names or to know details of their parents, and that that information has not been recorded by officials. The other huge challenge, I think, that, um, that Debbie's pointing to and that is important to recognize is that these adults are being held in immigration detention centers that have very low rates of re legal representation. Um, over 200 facilities around the country, most people don't have access to a lawyer. So uh, the idea, I mean, and, it, and, it's, and it's wonderful that people are supporting uh, legal representation in immigration detention. That's incredibly important, because we need thousands of Virginia Raymonds to go in and represent these parents and, and fight that fight. And you have President Trump now talking about, we're not bringing in thousands of judges, he said. Right, which which totally, which again completely uh, clogs up the system, keeps these parents uh, stuck in limbo uh, without uh, without a, a decision on their cases. Um, if I may, Amy, I mean one of the things that that pops up again and is actually a huge stain on on President Obama's human rights record is long term prolonged family detention, something we saw develop. I know that you guys covered after 2014. Um, in 2015, I remember I went into a family detention center and spoke with families who had been detained for a year or more. They said that they were feeling had suicidal feelings, anxiety, depression. Family now, detention is very harmful. Uh, can you explain this, though? When yeah. you're talking about, under the Obama years, family detention, everyone has now heard about the Flores settlement. They may not know who Flores is, a 15-year-old Salvadoran, yeah. um, uh, on whom this settlement is based. But it said that children cannot be held for more than 20 days, and that is what Trump is dealing with now. He wants this overturned, yeah. so that he can continue to hold the children, maybe still, uh, at least, with their parents. But, in fact, you were going to centers, and our reporter, Dem uh, Democracy Now!'s Renee Feltz, was going to these centers where families were held for over a year. Right, because the Obama administration didn't want to comply with that legal settlement either. And it took committed advocacy uh, by uh, plaintiff's lawyers for those for the Flores children uh, and many, many others uh, to hold the Obama administration to that short-term 20-day limit. Uh, so when the Obama administration reinstituted family detention after eradicating it, um, they eradicated it in 2009, reinstituted it in 2014, they attempted to hold people indefinitely. Now, <clears throat> before we go to your big report on ICE detention and the terrible conditions uh, when it comes to access to medical care and people dying in ICE detention, Clara, I wanted to go back to Debbie Nathan, because this woman, who calls herself Delia, came here um, uh, because of domestic violence. Um, we'll talk about that in a moment, uh, because it looks like we just lost Debbie. Um, so we're going to go back to Clara Long to talk about the new report uh, that she has just come out with. Clara Long is a senior researcher at Human Rights Watch. Code Red, that's the name of this explosive Human Rights Watch report released this week that exposes dangerously substandard medical care and ICE detention facilities around the country. More people died in immigration detention 
in 2017 than any year since 2009. Physicians reviewed 15 deaths in immigration detention from December 2015 to April 2017, determining that substandard medical care contributed or led to eight of the 15 deaths. Here is the video Human Rights Watch produced to accompany the report. You hear first from the report's author, our guest Clara Long, then Dr. Robert Cohen, who investigated ICE medical reports of deaths in custody. This is Clara Long. Moises Tino Lopez had first one and then a second seizure in immigration detention. Our medical experts said that the first seizure and certainly the second seizure should have prompted a high level of care and concern. That did not happen. And he ultimately had a third seizure that was fatal. My task here was to, was to say, was this death preventable? And in the majority of the cases that I reviewed, uh, the deaths were preventable if the medical and correctional staff had done the right thing. In the seven-year period from 2010 to 2017, 74 people have died in immigration detention. In 52 of those cases, we've been able to examine some government records. In 23 cases, poor medical care contributed to the fatal outcome. The major problems were uh, inadequate staffing, not having doctors on site as often as you might need to, not having medications available, delays in diagnosis, and delays in access to emergency care. Back in 1994, 6,800 people were locked up on any given night in immigration detention. But that number has rapidly increased over the last two administrations. And right now, over 40,000 people a night are in detention centers around the country. The Trump administration has asked for funding to increase that number to 52,000 people a night by the end of 2019. They hope to use the system to deport people rapidly and without due process. Unfortunately, even short periods of time inside detention centers uh, with dangerous conditions, like poor medical care, can lead to very serious consequences. That's Clara Long, senior researcher at Human Rights Watch, the author of the report Code Red, The Fatal Consequences of Dangerously Substandard Medical Care and Immigration Detention. Clara, continue with what you're saying in this report. It is terrifying. It's terrifying. ICE, uh, what we found is that ICE, the agency that's de detaining, uh, as we said, now 40,000 uh, people a day and, and wants to expand, uh, cannot provide adequately for the safety of the people that it holds. Uh, these deaths are really the tip of the iceberg. One thing I want to emphasize is that, although our medical experts found that eight of the 15 deaths, these recent deaths that we were able to review, uh, were ones in which poor care contributed or led to the fatal outcome, in 14 of the 15 cases, there was, there was clear evidence that uh, ICE facilities and medical care, care professionals were involved in dangerous practices that could have caused death in like. another case. Like, um, in many of these facilities, you have licensed practical nurses, people who have had about 18 months of training post high school, who are charged with making uh, medical diagnoses and managing very serious conditions. In one of the cases we reviewed, a man had new onset congestive heart failure. He wasn't able to see a doctor. Instead, he saw one of these licensed practical nurses who told him to drink more water, something we hear a lot from people who are detained as the, as the panacea. Um, in the case of congestive heart failure, that can actually make it worse and, and, and lead to a, to a fatal outcome, because your heart is not able to clear the, the fluid out of your body. Um, in other cases, we, um, you know, we saw, you know, this botched emergency response, this very, in, these indifferent attitudes. Um, for example, Mr. Jose Azurdia, who died in Adelanto detention in facility in, in, um, in 2015, began to have the symptoms of a heart attack. You know, he had chest pain, he was sweating. Uh, a nurse actually entered the unit uh, for another reason. And, and was told, this man is sick, he's vomiting. She said, I don't want to see him because I don't want to get sick. And that started this two-hour delay to, for him to get to the hospital to get care for this heart attack. Our medical expert said, you know, when you're having a heart attack, this is probably obvious to everyone, time is muscle. So the more time that you don't get treatment for a heart attack, the more of your heart muscle dies and the harder it is to survive. Tell us more of these stories of the people who you found that, whose deaths were directly a result of the lack of medical care or the horrible medical care within the ICE detention facilities. Sure. Um, we mentioned in, in the um, 
in the video, a, a man named Moises Tino Lopez. He was 23 years old, has a family, children, um, and he and he had a, a seizure in uh, in Hall County Jail in Nebraska. Uh, the staff there just took his his mattress and put it on the floor. That's all they did. They didn't they didn't send him to a doctor. Uh, he ended up seeing a nurse, but and was prescribed seizure medication. But uh, there seemed to be some sort of there was a there was a language. Um, uh, barrier. There was uh, sort of unexplained reasons why nurses didn't follow up on him not taking that seizure medication. He had another seizure. They again did not respond. Um, instead, putting him in an isolation cell where he seized again and died. Um, you know, these are people who are beloved members of communities uh, who are swept up into this dangerous system. And if you allow me, I mean, one of the things that's really worrying about this executive order and the moment we're in now in terms of the end of so-called, you know, mass family separation is that we're starting a family incarceration crisis and um, that we're putting more and more vulnerable people into this dangerous system. Already, the Trump administration has begun um, doing the generalized detention of pregnant women, uh, detaining people who are seeking asylum, even people who are coming in at ports of entry, trying to do everything right, keeping them throughout, through in prolonged periods throughout the pendency of their cases. The exposure is just growing and growing to this dangerous system, which makes this, this, uh, these findings so very worrying, because more and more people will be exposed to conditions that very predictably, in the words of our independent experts, cause death. And how long, on average, were these people being held in ICE detention? And explain the facilities. I think very few people understand all the different layers of prisons, detention centers, tent cities. You have mothers who have been brought up from the border, separated from their children. They're in a uh, Washington state prison. Um, yet these are not criminals. Yeah, it, it's a patchwork of facilities that are flung out across the United States, oftentimes in uh, very isolated areas where, you know, it's difficult for, for medical professionals or lawyers to, to reach. Um, the, the, as you say, they, they, involve, they include uh, county jails. Uh, a, a majority of them are uh, private prison companies uh, that have been stood up sometimes explicitly for immigration detention. And in recent weeks, we've seen the Trump administration put about 1,500 people now into federal prison, uh, which raises a whole other set of concerns about high, how ICE is um, <clears throat> supposed to uh, ensure oversight of those conditions and of, of access to those people uh, when it can't even keep its own house in order. Um, you know, the, you asked about the range of detention. You know, it's interesting because we we see uh, these dangerous conditions affect people at, at many different amounts of time in detention. I mean, one case that comes to mind is a man named um, Igor Zyasen. He was a Russian national who crossed into the into the U.S. in 2016. And um, he carried with him in his backpack, he came with his wife, uh, he carried with him his heart medication and um, some information about his condition. But they put that and locked it up in his property, never examined it, and didn't allow him to access it. Um, when he was detained at the San Luis Regional Detention Center, he began to have, again, chest pain. Uh, a nurse, uh, a licensed practical nurse, uh, said, OK, well, I'll give you some nitroglycerin. Um, that, you know, chest pain in someone with a heart trouble should prompt nitroglycerin and a call to 911. She did not do that. Instead, some correctional officers there said, actually, I don't know if we want to have this really sick guy in our facility. So they decided to sort of pack him up and actually put him in a van and drive him four hours to another facility where they thought there was better medical care. Um, there he did get an EKG. Uh, there, he did see a doctor. But, uh, but even before that EKG was, was read, he had, um, had another heart attack and, and died in his cell there. Wow. Well, on Thursday, dozens of parents and kids protested at the offices of the Thomas R. of Thomas R. Decker, the new New York field office director for ICE enforcement and removal operations, in protest of the Trump administration's zero tolerance policy. This is some of the voices of the kids and parents there. My name is Isabel Valera, and I'm here because I think that it's unfair that children are getting locked up for no reason when they're not even breaking the law. I think this is clearly a moment when many, many people have gotten outraged about the family separation issue. It's so emotional. I think the big question is now, how can we take that wave of outrage and redirect it or, or continue to focus it on U.S. policy around immigration more broadly? I'm Jamara Rose Davis, and I'm eight years old. 
young immigrants should be free to stay with their parents and their parents should be free to stay with their kids. No kid should be in jail. My name is Mirna Haider. Last week I was here for my own immigration interview in the same very building um, and it's really, uh, I'm feeling intensely to be here again, vulnerable, where my application is not really fully approved yet, uh, but I'm with my American children and for, in some weird way they are giving me strength to be here so we can fight for other children um, and other families. Incarceration in general sucks and it usually impacts only people of color or people who don't have citizenship or people who are poor um, and uh, incarceration. My name is Jojo Gelman and I'm 10 years old. I'm protesting that people and their kids are getting sent to jail because they're from a different country. My sign says, get your tiny hands off our children. And the tiny hands person means Donald, Donald Trump. Those are the voices of children and parents protesting outside the ICE offices in New York and inside as well. Special thanks to Democracy Now!'s Nat Needham. Um, it is very important to hear these voices, because these are the voices that are changing national policy in this country, as the uh, corporate media interviews the politicians and, you know, they're critical in making decisions. It is the protests around this country this week, the enormous outcry that has clearly forced President Trump into retreat. Now, I want to turn to Virginia Governor Ralph Northam, who's called for an investigation after the Associated Press expose about conditions at the Shenandoah Valley Juvenile Center. The AP reported immigrant children as young as 14 housed um, say they were beaten while handcuffed and locked up for long periods in solitary confinement, left nude and shivering in concrete cells. Clara Long, can you respond to this? Right. This is a detention center that's within the Office of Refugee Resettlement Network. So it, it's a detention center that's holding unaccompanied children, including children who would be separated. It's it's a it's called a staff secure facility. So that means it looks a lot like juvenile detention, um, juvenile criminal justice detention in the United States. Um, you know what? You know you were saying the power of these protests. Uh, I, I have to tell you, I mean, the allegations in that complaint have been a, a matter of public record for a, over a year now, um, and something that we've been following and been very concerned about. But this is the moment in which uh, people can hear them, uh, and and that's uh, that's hopeful to me. Uh, the, the and the allegations are, are terrible. I, I feel. Very particularly impacted by them because I actually met a, a child in Mexico who had who had been in that center, independent of it, before I knew of this lawsuit, and told me exactly the same thing that he had seen children uh, shackled and beaten and tased while he was detained there. And what about this news that we were reporting on yesterday about children in detention facilities being injected with drugs and being forced to take drugs? Right. I mean that again. You know we've. Recently, uh, that is sort of of a piece of these serious concerns, particularly with the the staff, the, the what they call staff secure uh, portions of the OR facilities, uh, in which um, there doesn't seem to be adequate oversight, uh, accountability, investigations of conditions. I mean, the most important thing to recognize here also is that uh, for the, you know, under human rights law, um, children should not be detained for immigration reasons. Uh, it's simply too harmful uh, for the countervailing governmental interest. The story about um, Shiloh Treatment Center in southern Houston, right. uh, where kids held they are forcibly injected with medications that make them dizzy, listless, obese, even incapacitated. Yeah. Uh, this, according to reports by Reveal. Meanwhile, according to another Reveal investigation, taxpayers have paid more than one and a half billion dollars over the past four years to companies operating immigration youth facilities, despite facing accusations of rampant sexual and physical abuse. Right. Correct. You what know, kind of control is there over this immigration industrial complex, the private corporations that are running these facilities? Some are also nonprofits. Yeah, I mean, this is why it's so incredibly important that people who are outraged by the family separation do not look away now, uh, because there needs to be 
uh, increased public pressure, increased attention to exactly that question, Amy. What kind of control is there over these facilities? Because no one, no, no one seems to be minding the store in terms of uh, making sure that people's rights are respected. Clara Long, I want to thank you for being with us, senior researcher at Human Rights Watch, author of the report that will link to Code Red, The Fatal Consequences of Dangerously Substandard Medical Care and Immigration Detention. This is Democracy Now! When we come back, the harrowing story of an Eritrean man who was held in detention in Broward County, Florida. Terrified if he was returned to Eritrea, he would be killed. The U.S. deported him. On his way back at Cairo Airport, he took his own life. Stay with us. Turn the Funkies here on Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We turn now to the story of Zarsine Hermes Tesfatsian, who took his own life at Cairo International Airport earlier this month after being deported from the United States. He was 34 years old. Zarsine was detained in the United States for more than a year after fleeing his home country of Eritrea, seeking asylum here in the U.S. He spent more than a year in immigration detention, first in South Florida, then in Ohio, before being deported this month. Zarsine was in transit back to Eritrea when he died by suicide at Cairo Airport more than two weeks ago, but his family has yet to locate his body. Friends and family are demanding to know why he was deported to Eritrea, despite his fears he would be tortured, even killed, if he returned home. On Tuesday, I spoke to Zarsine's friend, Baraket Sabatu. Baraket met Zersenai as a volunteer translator at the Broward Transitional Center, an immigrant detention center in South Florida, where Zersenai was jailed. Baraket was not alerted when Zersenai was transferred to Ohio a few months ago, nor was he told his friend was going to be deported. Here is Baraket speaking Tuesday about his friend, Zersenai Hermes Tetsatsion. Zersenai, he was very, he had a hope. And uh, he was very nice guy. He's very. He becomes a friend right away, like you. And then he even helped his friends. They were there with him at detention. He always give them encourage. He told them, "Oh, one day is gonna be over. Uh, we're gonna be okay. We are in the right country. We have a peace right now. Peace of mind. We just wait for the day to come out from here." And then one day we'll be get together, and then we're going to talk about this, what happened in the story. That's why he was had a dream. Did he tell you what he most feared if he were deported to Eritrea? What he said in his testimony is, uh, he said, if he, they ask him, uh, the lawyer is, uh, what would happen if he go, go back to Eritrea, he said, I might go jail or tortured, I might be even get killed. Do you believe that the U.S. deporting uh, Zarsanai was a death sentence for him? That's what I believe, because if they know, if they know Eritrea is not the right place right now, he cannot deport to Eritrea, why? There is a knight has to get deported. For that situation, he ended up killing himself. How does it make you feel, Baraket? I feel very sad. And at the same time, as the family want to find out how could happen, how could hang himself in a Cairo airport, the loved ones. They, they want to find out how would happen, kill himself, who give him to hang in a bathroom. 
At the same time, I just talked to yesterday one of his cousins why his body, remain body, is still in Cairo. Mommy is waiting every single day in the airport. In the airport where? In the airport of Eritrea and Asmara to, find, uh, to, to get his remain body. That was Bereket Sabatu speaking about his friend, Zersenai Ermias Tetsvatsion, who took his own life at Cairo International Airport earlier this month after being deported from the United States to Eritrea. Human Rights Watch reports Eritrea is one of the, quote, world's most oppressive governments, unquote. According to a 2016 report, Eritreans are often required to serve in national military service indefinitely. Those who try to flee the country are considered traitors. The Guardian reported this week at least three Eritrean teenagers have died by suicide in Britain in the last six months. The teenagers came to Britain from the uh, Calais migrant camp. For more, we're joined by Christine Ho, founding director of Friends of Broward Detainees, a volunteer visitation program that provides human humanitarian support for unauthorized immigrants and asylum seekers inside the Broward Transitional Center, the Immigrant Detention Center in South Florida. She visited Zersenai Hermias Tetsatsvion in detention. Christine, welcome to Democracy Now! We only have a few minutes. Talk about what happened. He so clearly had real fear that he would be killed for leaving um, military service in Eritrea if he were returned, as so many are fearful of doing. How did he end up dead at Cairo Airport? Thank you so much. I'm very honored to be invited here today. <clears throat> I can only guess that he, um, that he felt hopelessness and despair, which is actually quite common uh, in, in immigration detention, which is not a picnic for anyone, not only not for children, but also for adults. Um, it's highly stressful, which is well documented by a body of psychological research. It's, um, and it, it basically, one of the reasons why detention is so, uh, takes a psychological toll is because they have no idea how long they're going to be in detention. So the suspense kills them, in a sense. Um, in his case, I think he had high hopes of being uh, released, uh, because I, I visited one of his friends in Broward Transitional Center uh, a couple of weeks ago, and he told me he had received a letter written in Ohio by Sarah and I, um, who mentioned in the letter that he was, he expected to be released in, in a week or two. And so it must have, I mean, he must have been just struck. Did you feel, that, Christine Ho, that this deportation was a death sentence for Zersenai? It could very well be, in the sense that it must have filled him with such hopelessness and despair, um, as well as fear of what, might, what he might experience if he actually did return to his homeland. Um, Christine, in the last minute we have, can you talk about the psychological effects of long-term detention? You visited hundreds of detainees at the Broward County facility. Um, Zaris right. and I had been there for about a year. Yes. Um, it takes a tremendous toll. They, um, first of all, uh, it's especially difficult for asylum seekers, because the process of, uh, of processing asylum claims takes a long time, months, sometimes years. And um, it, they, they feel, uh, and because they have no idea how long it's, it's going to be, it, it really takes a psychological toll. It's been described by others as soul-destroying. Soul um, it's, and it's, it's also a, a very difficult experience on a day-to-day -day basis, daily indignities, daily humiliations, and also pettiness. Uh, it's, it's in addition to the medical issues that uh, were discussed by Clara Long. Christine Ho, uh, we have to mm -hmm. uh, end the show here. I want to thank you for being with us, founding director of Friends of Broward Detainees, um, and we'll continue to follow this case and see if Zersenai's body is returned. We want to wish Karen Bernucci a happy birthday. Democracy Now! is produced by a remarkable group of people. Special thanks to Renee Feltz, Mike Burke. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks for joining us.